So far in our discussion on protein purification processes, we discussed four different methods. We began by discussing the process of salting out. And in salting out, we separate the proteins based on their solubility and salt concentrations. Then we discuss dialysis, in which we separate proteins from tiny molecules and ions by using a semi-permeable membrane. Next, we moved on to gel filtration chromatography, in which we separate the protein mixture based on their size. And finally, we discussed ion exchange chromatography, in which we separate the proteins based on their net charge. Now we're going to discuss a fifth method by which we can purify our protein mixture. And in this method, we also use a specific property of proteins. So many proteins inside our body have a specific high affinity to some type of molecule. And the general example of these proteins are enzymes. So enzymes are these proteins found inside our body that bind to specific substrate molecules and accelerate the reaction, basically increase the rate at which that reaction actually takes place. Enzymes are biological catalysts. And we have many different types of enzymes in our body. For example, just in our immune system alone, we have many, many, many proteins, these protective proteins we call antibodies. And our body manufactures these antibodies so that they bind to specific types of molecules we call antigens. So for every antigen, we have a specific type of antibody that can bind to that antigen and that antigen alone. Another example is the DNA polymerase molecule. So DNA polymerase is basically this enzyme complex that only binds to specific sequence of nucleotides on our DNA. And once the binding takes place, once the enzyme binds onto our DNA, that initiates the process of DNA replication. Another example is glucose oxidase. This enzyme binds specifically to glucose molecules, sugar molecules we call glucose. And we can go on and on. So we have many, many examples of these specific proteins, these proteins that bind to specific molecules and have high affinity for these molecules. So this is another property that we can use to separate proteins. And the method that uses this property is known as affinity chromatography. So a method called affinity chromatography basically separates, allows us to purify and isolate specific type of protein molecules from within a mixture of proteins based on their affinity to bind to specific molecules. Now, just like in gel filtration chromatography and ion exchange chromatography, we also have the same exact setup in affinity chromatography. So we have a funnel, we place the funnel on top of a long, narrow column, and inside that column, we pack that column with these insoluble gel beads. Now, in the case of affinity chromatography, what we want to do is we basically want to modify those gel beads and we want to attach a specific type of group or molecule onto those gel beads. For example, if we zoom, uh, zoom in on one of these gel beads, we get the following diagram and notice that to the gel bead, we basically attach a specific type of group we're going to call group Y. Now, what type of group do we want to attach? Well, the type of group we want to attach basically corresponds to that substrate molecule that the protein that we want to actually isolate binds to. And to see exactly what we mean, let's take a look at the following diagram. So let's zoom in onto the molecular level to a small section of this column. We basically get the following diagram. Now in that column, we basically have these beads. Now, we also have a beaker that contains a crude mixture of proteins. So we have three proteins and we only want to isolate one 
of those three proteins. Now, what we know about these three proteins is one of those proteins binds to a specific molecule, let's say a glucose molecule, and the other two enzymes proteins do not bind to enzyme molecules. So we have a green molecule, which is enzyme number one that has a high affinity for glucose. So it basically has an active site that can accommodate a glucose molecule. We have enzyme number two in red that does not bind to glucose and also enzyme number three in orange that also does not bind to glucose so we take the beaker of these mixture proteins we essentially dump them into our column and they begin to move along our column now only those enzymes that have the active side that can accommodate and bind onto the glucose will actually bind onto the glucose and so only these green molecules will become trapped because they're bound onto the glucose of the beads and the other two enzymes, enzyme two and three, will not interact with the glucose in any way, so they will simply continue traveling along and down our column. So when we pour the crude mixture of proteins, the protein with affinity for glucose will bind to the beads. For example, that protein could be glucose oxidase that we spoke about earlier, or it could be some other protein that also binds to glucose. So the other molecules, however, these proteins here, did not bind to the glucose on the beads, and so they continue traveling to the bottom of that column. So let's take a look at the following five diagrams that basically describes how this process actually takes place. So here we have our experimental setup. We have our column, we have the funnel, and this is our beaker that contains that crude mixture of three proteins. So we have the green enzyme one, the red enzyme two, and the orange enzyme three. And only enzyme one has a high affinity for glucose. So these are our beads. So we essentially pour our solution into our column. And so initially, at the initial moment we pour our solution, all of these proteins essentially congregate at the top of our column. Now, over time what happens is, because these two proteins have no affinity for the glucose on the beads, they will continue moving down our column as a result of the gravitational pull. But that protein enzyme number one that has a high affinity for glucose will essentially bind onto that glucose molecule that is bound onto the beads and this will happen ultimately at the beginning of our column now some of these enzymes will make it farther uh, farther down but most of these enzymes bind uh, in the beginning towards the beginning of that column so we have enzyme number one in this, and we have a bunch of enzymes number one throughout our beads throughout the column. Now enzyme two and three don't bind to any of the beads, and so they simply continue moving all the way to the bottom. So we see that the mixture of protein two and three will essentially be mixed together because none of them actually bind, none of them are attracted to those glucose molecules bound to our beads. And so in step four, we essentially turn the knob and we open up our hole, and so that allows the movement of these two proteins that we did not want to separate in the first place, and we basically place it in this beaker, and so now we can dump that out because we don't want to actually use this in our experiment. Remember, our focus was basically to isolate protein number one and not protein number two or protein number three. Okay, and finally in the last step. So the question is, how do we get that protein number one out of that be uh, out of that column because the problem now is these proteins are bound to the beads found in that column so in in, in uh, this particular case what we can basically do is we can create a solution of glucose and that glucose is essentially not bound to anything in that solution. So this is our glucose solution and we wash that column down with the glucose solution. So what will happen is the glucose that is free to move in that solution will now compete for that active side 
found on that enzyme, enzyme number one, and it will outcompete that glucose that is bound onto the beads. And so once that glucose replaces the glucose that was bound to the beads, that protein that was initially bound to the bead will essentially will essentially uh, move away from that bead and will continue moving down our column because now it contains the active side that is filled with that glucose. And in this manner, we can basically wait until it goes all the way to the bottom. We can open up our, uh, we can open up our knob and so that will essentially be collected into some type of beaker or some type of test tube as shown in the following diagram. And so now, following our affinity chromatography method, we have this uh, solution that is purely one protein, protein one, the protein that we wanted to isolate in the first place. So we see that this method is only useful if we know what specific molecule that protein actually binds to. And if we also know that the other proteins in that mixture don't bind to that specific molecule, as we saw in this particular case. So if we know that these other two enzymes have no affinity or a very low affinity for our glucose, while this one has a very high affinity, this method was useful because it allowed us to actually isolate our protein number one. But if all of these proteins had a high affinity for glucose, then this would not have been a useful method because all of them would have been trapped in our column. And so we would have had no way of actually removing these two proteins that we don't want and isolate that protein, at least not with this uh, affinity chromatography technique.